Is Prince Harry's private jet habit becoming a problem? Why were the British royals not included in a gathering of their European cousins? And what is the secret behind Princess Beatrice's stylish new look? We've got lots to discuss on this week's show. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential, the world's very best royal program. It's just the facts. I'm just reporting the facts. I'm Joe Elvin and I have just the one guest this week. But what a guest he is. <laughs> it's our very own, of course, the Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden, and an absolute fan favorite from Palace Confidential. Welcome. Welcome. Now, a reminder that if you enjoy hearing from the likes of Richard, please subscribe to our channel because it's free and you'll be reminded whenever a new episode arrives. Now, let's have a quick catch up first on the family's many engagements this week and the king making a perhaps unexpected speech last night. This was a key moment. It was um, the King and Queen's first visit to the City of London, um, Britain's financial district, um, for the first time since the coronation. And it was a speech to the liveried um, organisations, the liveried companies, which are the um, ancient, really, companies do a lot for charity and this type of thing. Mm. And he was making a speech, and it was really his thoughts about the state of Britain, actually. And it was very timely, because the theme was all about um, moderation, what, what makes us British, how do we get on with each other, this type of thing. And he was stressing, um, you know, it did come obviously after the um, conflict in Israel. Um, things have got um, very tense. Mm. We've had, you know, lots of unpleasant incidents around the country and, um, and he was sort of addressing that and he got onto the subject of social media as well. And basically it was an appeal for tolerance and appeal for calm and for accepting different opinions. <laughs> Good luck with that, King Charles. <laughs> Good luck. Yes. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know how much time um, King Charles spends on social think media he's a big TikToker? himself. <laughs> um, no, but he's certainly very much aware of it. And he's aware, um, you know, through his sons and his, um, his daughter-in-law, through their work on social media. Maybe maybe that someone prints out Twitter for him every morning and <laughs> lays it down with the eggs. Yeah. But I think yeah. he's, you know, it's a theme that he's, um, sort of um, campaigned on really all his life and that has been tolerance and I mean this is someone who's spent so many years trying to get different um, religions to work together mm. to um, find what we have in common um, you know and at times like this he, he does have a really vital role to play I think. Well it, it seems like probably one of his biggest statements and biggest interventions since becoming the king could he be I, I don't I, this is going to sound rude but could he actually be an effective leader in in this space do you think he could actually make a difference I think he could I mean that's one of um, the great advantages of having you know a monarch as, as head of state he's not tainted by politics he's not on one side or the other people are not going to say well you would say that wouldn't you you know he does bring that independence and um, and I think he can make a difference. Um, people have stressed that this was a very personal speech. He wrote it himself. You know, usually these speeches are, you know, created by a team of people in his office, but this was very much him. He's been working on. So I think it, it really um, was from the heart and it certainly um, seems to have been um, greeted very warmly among the the, the guests at the dinner. It's interesting that you say um, he can't be accused of picking a side because he hung out with Harry and Meghan's wedding DJ this week as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is um, this is the um, Idris Elba, you know, good actor who um, national, almost national treasure, I'd say. I, I think he is yeah. almost reaching sort of national yeah. treasure status. You know, he sort of um, made his name. Everyone thought he was American because he made his name in the um, gritty crime drama The Wire. And he but was so good at being American. Exactly, yeah. but he, he's not American. He, he is, he is British. <laughs> and, um, One of us. Yeah, and he um, kind of gets on with everyone. So, for example, he's been involved with the Prince's Trust um, for some time. He does a, a lot of good work on that front. Um, we all know how much work the Prince's Trust has done in helping create businesses, really, and give people a chance, giving them grants, um, you know, with no strings attached to just encourage them. And lots of people have benefited from that. And also, he's um, he's good friends with Harry and Meghan, too. He actually... Um, Maybe he could sort of <laughs> pave the way to a more peaceful time for the family. <laughs> yeah, possibly, yeah. I mean, he, he actually performed as a DJ at their... Um, 
their wedding reception in the evening. Um, he, he did mention afterwards how um, it wasn't just up to him to choose the records. It sounds like Megan had had a very, um, <laughs> how, sh how should we say, sort of interventionist role in <laughs> choosing every record that he played. Um, so I'm not sure how much he actually... You no, know, it was the bride's day. Well, I don't know what you're trying to imply, Richard. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite funny. I mean, you get someone like him with his you know, reputation and say, actually, this is what you're going to play. Um, but anyway, I think he, he gets on with everyone, so he, he's a good um, role model. And this, we should say this meeting was um, it was ahead of um, King Charles and Queen Camilla's um, visit to Kenya, which mm. is going to be an important one. Yes, we'll come on to that in a minute, but just quickly, the Waleses were at the rugby again. They love the rugby. <laughs> they, they do love the rugby, and um, but they have that slight problem that they're patrons of different teams. So um, Prince William, who's patron of the Welsh rugby, he um, went to cheer on Wales at the Rugby World Cup in France. Um, he took Prince George, so he's obviously trying to make sure that Prince George supports Wales with the Prince of Wales. And then we had Catherine giving England a pep talk in the dressing room. But despite being <laughs> Princess of Wales, Catherine is patron of English rugby. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's a bit, bit of a conflict there. Um, but anyway, so she, um, Catherine, went to watch um, England play and England win, so she seems to be a bit of a lucky mascot. And then she just happened to um, want to visit the um, the players in the changing room after. So that's, I, <laughs> I think th that's what we call princess privilege. I, I'm that's sure. Fine. I'm yeah. sure they were on their best behaviour. Yeah. I think this was before they got in the showers. You know. Oh my goodness! Is 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 a sweaty old rugby locker room really the place for a princess? <laughs> Is that really, is, well, that, is that appropriate? Uh, anyone who saw that podcast recently with Mike Tyndall and James Haskell knows that um, Catherine does, does love rugby. Um, she is interested and she seems to be um, really enthusiastic about her role as patron I, of English rugby. I so. love how sporty she is. I think, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing for a role model to and, be. And we've really got sporty. Princess Anne is patron of Scottish rugby, so they're all cheering on the, the rival teams. So there's a lively Christmas table then. But yeah. Anyway, well, speaking of, we were talking earlier about Kenya, and there's an interesting piece written by dear friend of the show, Kate Manzi, uh, this week about the King's trip to Kenya at the end of this month, and she says it's actually a smarter move than it might first appear. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the point that Kate was making in her article, um, which was for our Royals page, Mel Online, that's well worth a look. And Kate... Nice, nice <laughs> work. Yeah. Um, Kate was making the point that um, the King and Queen, really, for their first overseas visit of their reign, would be expected to visit some of their realms. You know, he's not just... Um, they're not just King and Queen of the United Kingdom. There's all the other realms as well. But they chose not to. They chose to. They're visiting Kenya, um, which is a Commonwealth country, but has been independent for 60 years. Mm. But it, it's remained close friend and ally of Britain. And her point was that that was a clever move because it's showing that um, you know Britain values all the Commonwealth countries. It values all these friendships and alliances, and that. Um, he's not just going to be a king of, of Britain and, and the realms. You know, he'll be, he wants to be representing all the Commonwealth. I thought it was really interesting that Kate also points out that the language around these trips has really changed. And it's, it's subtle but significant. It's, it's, it's a visit. It's not a tour. Do you think that that shows a bit of cautiousness or even timidity? Yeah, I think what, what she was getting at was that um, tour sort of sounds like, you know, I'm the king, I'm touring my territories. It sounds sort of superior, condescending, sort yeah. of superior, whereas a visit is more, I'm going to see what you're doing and, uh, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, personally, I, I don't know, it, it worries me really, because where a lot of this comes from is Prince William and Catherine's visit to um, West Indies, which I thought was a great success, and people there seemed to think it was a success. But we just had all this sniping, mainly from Harry and Meghan cheerleaders, about, oh, look at them, you know, parading in their um, car at the airport, mm. like they're so superior and stuff. Well, no, they were doing, in that instance, for example, they were recreating um, Queen and Prince Philip's visit to, um, I think it was to Jamaica, um, all those years ago, and it was a tribute. You know, they were there representing the Queen, and it was a tribute um, to her. But there was a lot of criticism, and this is a sort of reaction, which I think is a mistake, because it's kind of... They shouldn't be apologising for... 
touring the Commonwealth. I, I, I so see forth. what you're saying, but I, I, I suppose, you know, the the perception around the Commonwealth and, and all of those things has, you know, the, the opinions about it have changed so much in recent times. And it's clear that the King probably doesn't have the same goodwill that the Queen enjoyed to, visiting, touring some of these places. And maybe he's just going to, he's preempting some pent up anger about the fact that some countries are within the Commonwealth. Mm, but poor King Charles. I mean, already this visit to Kenya, you know, the main sort of um, news story about it has been that he's going to make some sort of reference or apology to the um, Mau Mau uprising. That, you know, that was a, an uprising, you know, back in, I think it was 52 to 62, mm. you know, where it was terrible sort of repression of the tribes there. And, and he's going to be making some sort of amends for that. And you just feel like you, you don't want his foreign visits to become sort of one long, you know, apology tours. And I, d I don't think that's the route that the royal family should, should go down at all. You know, they need to be proud of the history and proud of being the royal family. Mm, well, it, it, time will tell. It'll be fascinating. But um, speaking of fascinating, let's now move on to really interesting picture in your column this week of the young European royals. Tell us who was in it and I suppose what's always more enjoyable, who wasn't? <laughs> this is a portrait essentially of the future of European monarchy. It was taken um, during the celebrations for Prince Christian of Denmark's 18th birthday. So in the middle of the portrait we have Prince Christian himself um, looking very dapper and, and proud. And then to his right, far right, we have Princess Estelle of Sweden, who's uh -huh. only, only 11. And next to her, um, we have Princess Ingrid Alexandra of Norway. And then to his left, we have Princess Katharina Amelia of the Netherlands. And then on his far right, sorry, far left is Princess Elizabeth of Belgium. Wow, there's a lot of royals <laughs> in the world, aren't there? More than I imagined. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so this is Prince Christian, who will eventually be um, King of Denmark. Is he Mary's? Son. Yes, he's yeah. Mary's yeah. son. Yeah. yeah, so he's next in line. Mm. And um, and the others will all be queens of their countries eventually. So I just thought it's very interesting, but obviously um, who was missing was probably Prince George would have, I mean, wouldn't he have looked lovely, you know, next to Princess Estelle? But, um, I mean, but do, they, do, we, do we think of the British royal family as being part of that? It's, no, that, that's the thing. They, yeah. I, you know, possibly they weren't even invited. I think they were royals. They've all got quite a close connection um, to Denmark. So it's, it's not a surprise that the mm. British royals um, were not there. But it does, it sort of sheds light really on that sort of difference between the British and the European royals. Well, you know, George had a rugby game to get to. Yes, he was, he was at the, <laughs> that weekend, on. he was at the rugby yeah. um, with his daddy. But you have written in your newsletter this week uh, <coughs> that if the royals, all the royals, joined forces, that it could be a force for good. What's your theory there? Yeah, well, I just think that um, there has been that distance. You know, I kind of go back to Queen Victoria and how, um, you know, she had this vision, really, that her children would go on to be, you know, the monarchs of Europe. And it was... Marry each other. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 they did. They did, you know, but it was a really positive vision yeah. of um, how it would bring people together. And that obviously didn't happen because of the First World War, the mm. Russian Revolution. Um, and since then, the British royals have been um, pretty distant. You know, they go to the big weddings and stuff like that, but not, um, not to sort of smaller events. And I, I just think that William and Catherine perhaps should um, start to forge those closer links. You know, because the, the royals, they've got a lot in common. And it's in their mutual interest. You know, they can be a force for good and show that monarchy can be modern, it can be useful, it's got a positive future. So mm. they should form their new trade union of monarchs. Well, we are very interested in what you might think of the European royals. And we'll have some more great pictures of those people coming up later in the programme. But what do you think? Do you want us to discuss the European royals more on the show? Let us know in the comments below. And speaking of comments, we love hearing from you. Let's hear some of your excellent thoughts now from last week's show. And after our discussion of the ghost of Princess Diana um, appearing in the new series of The Crown, hashtag highbrow, Cindy Sylvester was not impressed. She wrote, as an American, I think having the ghost of Princess Diana show up in any TV series is disgusting. 
she was loved by the public, and who is any writer in streaming land to put their words of what anyone in the family might have been thinking? In such a personal tragedy, I won't be watching it. Meanwhile, Anne-Marie Connors gave her thoughts on our chat about how William and Harry's mental health campaigns show how far they've drifted. It seems that the person most responsible for seeing to Meghan's mental health would be her husband. I've always found it hard to believe that Harry could not provide the help she needed. And after the Duke and Duchess of Sussex arrived to an event in New York in a huge convoy, Kiki Cowie, I hope I'm saying that right, Kiki, had this to say, they took seven vehicles for a three-minute walk. It took longer to load up than the walk would have. But they showed us how important they are. Very true. <laughs> Please keep those comments coming in and we'll stick with the subject of the Sussexes and their vehicles. So, Richard, uh, Harry and Meghan arrived back in the US, but this has already caused some controversy, hasn't it? <laughs> well, this is because they arrived back in the US after a quite a um, brief holiday to the um, Caribbean um, by private jet. And but it's so convenient. <laughs> it's so convenient. I know that's the thing. Come on, last week, um, you know, as you just mentioned, we were discussing, you know, cavalcade of um, vehicles in New York, and you know, a week later, we're discussing hiring a private jet just for the two of them to go on holiday. I mean, come on, the hypocrisy is breathtaking. I mean, when we say just for them, they didn't even take their children on holiday. So. Well, I mean, no, children on flights are a drag. Come <laughs> so, on. I'm just, so, just calling on. it as I see it. There were no yeah. other passengers to complain about <laughs> noisy children here. So, no, just them. So there was a <laughs> flight for the two of them yeah. to the Caribbean. I mean, it is extraordinary, isn't it, when you think about it? I mean, you know, this is Harry who, who started a travel company. He felt so strongly about Sustainable ethical travel, travel yeah. and how we all need to, you know, take fewer holidays or do this, that and the other. Uh, he launched this company, Travelist, and now here he is on a private jet again, just the two of them for a holiday. And well, yes, and some people, not me, you understand, dear. I, I don't judge. But some people would point out that other members of the royal family have managed to take scheduled flights without any privacy problems or being harassed. Or Is that fair? Yeah. I mean, I remember we've run diary stories over the years about, um, you know, for example, Prince and Princess and Michael of Kent just, you know, taking an easy jet, no frills airline to the south of France. Um, you know, Catherine and William and their family travel on standard. I mean, this is this is not to some unusual destination. There's plenty of flights from the USA to the Caribbean that you can get there lots of different ways. But let's be balanced. Do William and Catherine or Charles and Camilla, do they, do they ever not use private planes? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think they, they certainly have done. Mm. Um, uh, you know, circumstances vary. I think generally the royal family, they try to use um, standard flights when when possible, mm. um, but the whole thorny issue, isn't it, of people who talk about the environment and then do something different in their personal lives. What, what's interesting is that they flew back to Atlanta. Obviously, they live in California, so that's quite intriguing. It has been pointed out that their um, now close friend, Tyler Perry, has his huge studios in Atlanta, so mm. I don't know if it tied in with any sort of work projects, mm. but it all seems quite strange. Well, I've been to Atlanta. It's very nice. Oh, good. Maybe yeah. they just wanted to go. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's move on. Turning to one of your favourite royals now, Princess Beatrice, there was a very interesting piece on Mail Online this week about how she's reinvented her look. I mean, look, we've all been fascinated in um, Princess Eugenie and Beatrice's um, style choices. They like a statement. They like a statement headpiece. Well, they, they have done in the past. They really do. I mean, yeah. everyone remembers the um, the hat or the, the headpiece that um, Beatrice wore to Prince William and Catherine's wedding, oh, yeah. you know, being compared to a pretzel. And I don't think it was a pretzel, sort of thing. but I'm <laughs> okay. too polite to it, say. It was yeah. various yeah. things. <laughs> um, and there have been other sort of style choices as well that um, have caused a lot of interest. And th what this article was about is that Beatrice has now um, hired the services of a stylist called Elizabeth. Olivia Buckingham, maybe she was, you know, like the name Buckingham, yes, Palace and no, all that. What is it? Nominative, nominative determination. Uh, exactly. Is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So Olivia Buckingham has been helping her with some of her choices, and um, they pointed out um, lots of beautiful dresses that um, Beatrice has worn since she's been taking Olivia's advice. I mean, there, there was one that um, I thought was was amazing was at um, Royal Ascot in the summer. The Monique Lulier. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, Catherine got all the headlines because she was wearing a really bold red dress. But actually, Beatrice that day looked um, beautiful mm. in, in this dress that you mentioned. Mm. And there was other occasions when they went to a wedding of the Jordanian royal family. I remember that. Uh, yes. And Beatrice wore a series of dresses that looked 
looked um, just gorgeous. And very, very considered. I, I maintain, I'm pretty sure I said it back in May, she was my favorite outfit at the coronation. Yeah. That beautiful magenta Beulah London dress. And yeah. have, you, have you noticed a change, um, Joe, in, in, you know, that that's credited to this it's, stylist? It, yes, it's, she has definitely been looking more polished and as I say more considered and there's you know there's the, it's statements but it's not crackers stuff like like the hat so I feel like you know she's but also it just happens I think as you get older you learn what suits you and what doesn't but I hope so. she doesn't lose the quirkiness because come on come on clothes should be fun shouldn't they you know well, fashion they, they, should yes be fun. I I believe that I mean you know my husband laughs at everything <laughs> I wear but I'm not in the papers every day being laughed at by the public so no. I can understand why somebody would want a stylist to to try and not put a foot wrong. True, so, but, but yeah. we don't want her to be told, do we? we I hope she still Absolutely has lots not. of character. No, she's wonderful. Now, I'm asking you because I always do when we discuss the Yorks, but this is, do you think it's another argument? Bring back them, bring back the princesses into the into the working royal fold. Yeah, well, I think um, certainly it shows that she takes these things seriously. As you say, if she wears an outfit, you know, it will be pictured, there'll be lots of interest. So she it does have um, some importance in that way. And she obviously thinks about her public appearances and this sort of thing. And she is doing quite a lot of charity ventures. Um, and my view is that, you know, although she may not be used in a formal way, um, by the royal family um, to carry out um, engagements yet. We may see that in the future. I, I strongly suspect that Prince William might turn to his cousins when he needs support in the same way as we've seen um, Queen Elizabeth you know, really relied on all her cousins who are still the working members of the royal family now, the Duke of Gloucester, um, the Duke of Kent, Princess Alexandra, mm. you know, these older ones. So that wouldn't surprise me at all. And can I name drop just slightly, I once um, was seated next to Princess Beatrice at a dinner. Okay. She's very nice. Good. Thank you. <laughs> That's the beginning, middle and end of that story. <laughs> well, more glorious royal pictures for you now. Yep, it's montage time and we know you love it. And this week, as promised, here are a few of our royal family mingling with their European cousins. there now as always if you enjoy our content remember to like and subscribe it's free and that way you never need to miss another episode can't understand why you do that to yourself um, anyway thank you to my guest Richard Eden and to you for watching bye bye